Hi, I'm Sanders, uh, who's going to be talking about something pretty interesting, at least I found it was pretty interesting, um, trying to figure out, um, again, you know, you hear about all these data breaches, what actually happens, does it matter, does it actually impact the business? So uh, please put your hands together and welcome to the stage. Thank you, thank you, cool. Really happy to be here at Smoocon. I'm glad that like 16 of you made it past the party and got up this early, 11 o'clock's early, so thanks. So today, as the title kind of implies, we're going to be talking about stocks and breaches and if there's a correlation, causation, something like that. He pretty much summed up the entire talk in 15 minutes, so I'm going to have to just keep going through this. But I kid, obviously. Uh, my name's Chaim, as was mentioned, or almost mentioned, uh, and I currently work at Okta as a senior security engineer. And I also teach at a college called the Rochester Institute of Technology. There's probably no one here from that school, so it's not that important. Uh, additionally, I've worked running security programs, doing security research, and also security consulting over the vast amount of years that this has been going on. The important part here is that there's one thing you don't see on this. I don't do quantitative analytics like day-to-day -day on financial data. If I did, I probably wouldn't be at ShmooCon. I think that's pretty self-apparent. Uh, but I do it uh, in my spare time. I'm really interested in the topic, and obviously, I like playing with stocks, and uh, you know, I like making money. I don't think that applies to most people here. So, uh, with that disclaimer in mind, let's take a look at what we're going to be seeing for the rest of this talk. The first thing we're going to be looking at is kind of the motivation and the methodology. This is not the most important part, so we'll try and like breeze over it. I think most of you are pretty clear why we're doing this, but there's some interesting points. As with any kind of data that you're working on, though, I think it's important to know what the data looks like so that you can make valid conclusions about it. So we're going to be trying to slice the data up so that you guys can get a good idea of what this looks like and how we came to it. And then, of course, we'll spend a good amount of time on results and whether or not those results make any sense. So without further ado, let's talk about the motivation, right? This is pretty easy. All of us at some point have heard, hey, if there is a breach, the stock price of that company will drop. And it's a little bit weird that we hear that because it's not necessarily that intuitive. And I have like some hypotheses as to why that might be the case. If you're like a CISO trying to explain something to your board, it's a lot easier to say like, breach, stock price don't get breached, than it is to say, there might be a lawsuit, there might be a contentious point about what standard security controls are, we might have to pay, and therefore our, uh, the actual financial repercussions of a breach are significant. This makes more sense, and the board's not gonna look up this data. Additionally, we all have a lot of money. Some of us have a lot of money compared to the rest of the population. And as a result of that, we get to kind of want more. It's a weird, vicious loop. And so we like to think that with the knowledge that we have as security professionals, we can somehow manipulate the market in some way to make more money. And so this kind of thing comes out. But like doing anything else in security, like buying whatever the newest security hotness is, let's say like a threat intelligence platform, there are two questions that you should ask yourself. One, does this make any sense? Is there data to back up what's being said? There is a shocking lack of data in most of InfoSec, which is super disappointing. And then the second part is, if there is data that says this is the best, is it the best use of my time? Right? Does it make sense if I'm going to be making a fraction of a cent on a, you know, a million dollars that I should do this? Or in the case here, a lot of people here are going to be making some money, but then they'll have to pay short-term capital gains, maybe long-term capital gains. We're going to be hitting 25, 24% to 37%. That's a lot of the income that you might be trying to take home being going to Uncle Sam. So does that make it worth it? Well, before we jump into anything, we should look to see if there are examples of this working. And uh, of course there are, which is always fun. There's two examples I'm going to show you today. One is kind of a good example of it sort of working, and one is a bad example of it not working. Now importantly, these are vulnerabilities, not breaches, which we're going to distinguish in a little bit. But the principle is somewhat similar. So you can see here in 2016, St. Jude's Medical produced these embedded medical devices, and a company called MedSec found what was purported to be a severe vulnerability in them. Okay, cool. An ironically named company called Shall uh, Wow. An ironically named company called uh, Shallow Sh Muddy Waters. Sorry, Muddy Waters uh, shorted the stock simultaneously, which is an interesting thing to do upon a release. Now, although St. Jude's purported that the vulnerabilities were not severe. Uh, I'll point to the fact that the FDA actually ended up recalling the devices. And they ended up suing both Muddy Waters and MedSec. And it seems like this plan actually worked. It seems like the, the stock did drop. So the 
uh, the actual case uh, the case reports are really interesting. If you're into reading briefs and legal briefs, definitely check it out. A very interesting case to go over. On the opposite side, though, we see a situation like this where CTS Labs found some vulnerabilities in AMD processors. This is right around the Spectre meltdown time. I think we all remember that time. And they tried to pump it up and then also short the stock. And this failed pretty much. Every, all the news articles is about this failing. So it seems like there's two different things that happen here with very similar initial start points. Are there maybe some aspects that we can cut this data on to make it more useful? Well, this is when we start actually trying to use science, right? Like, this is not a good evaluation. That's like a Wall Street bets mentality. Like, <laughs> let's, just, let's just go. Balls to the wall. We'll see if it works. No, instead, let's review the existing work that we have here and see if there's enough information that we think we can improve upon it. And that's what I set out to do when I first kind of did the, it, the initial iteration of this talk back in 2018. Uh, there was a bunch of academic papers, but they're usually older. They're usually like 2015, 2016, and the amount of data that has happened since then has changed drastically. So it's not really fair to like look at them and come to the same conclusion. Uh, kind of the more recent stuff is the Comparatech stuff, and it's actually quite good and interesting to read. There are some shortcomings, though. Uh, the major shortcoming is that from a sampling perspective, there's only 24 companies and 28 breaches. That's really not a huge sample size. Uh, and so that was one of the big factors that was identified and that I'll try and improve, and you'll see we keep going uh, down that path. Additionally, we're focusing on the largest breaches. That's an interesting slice to look at, but maybe not representative of the whole market. Maybe there's more we can do there. And, uh, of course, we're only focusing on U.S. stocks. We're actually not going to improve upon that necessarily in this particular talk, but we're not going to focus only on NASDAQ stocks. We're also going to focus on New York Stock Exchange stocks as well. The summary here is the interesting part, where they're like, the low point is reached 14 days after the initial breach, and we're dropping 2.89% on average and under, underperforming the NASDAQ by about 4.5%. That seems like something you would invest in, but the one thing they don't really talk about is standard deviations. So that average is not particularly that helpful. And we'll actually see that the initial work I did to reproduce this and then expand it shows that that's not like what's going to happen. And then the expanded stuff that we're going to see uh, is going to really show kind of game, uh, I'm going to ruin the, the end of this, that that's not necessarily helpful. And you would definitely need to slice the data in other ways to determine whether or not there's a useful uh, aspect, a useful feature that you can really uh, dissect the data by. Cool. Um, so one of the important things I want to note as we go through this is this talk is really kind of statistically based, but a lot of people here probably don't understand like p-values and f-scores and things like that. So all that data is available in the Jupyter Notebook, and I will at times say things are not statistically significant, particularly if they're not, I will call it out. Otherwise, you can assume that the data that I'm presenting is statistically significant, and you can back it up with the actual numbers. That's important. All right, so the first iteration of this took the 28 breaches and tried to reproduce it, and then I was like, well, we need more breaches, but I don't want to define what the word breach means because that's really complicated. So I was like, okay, well, Wikipedia will do that for me. And this was a really poor decision, it turned out, which is interesting. Uh, but Wikipedia has a, a literal list. It's just called List of Breaches, if you Google it. And uh, it comes with 261 breaches, of which 71 were publicly traded companies, and 50 of those I could get data for at the time of. The initial feedback was that's not enough samples, and that's absolutely correct. So for this time around, I used the Varus Community Database, also known as VCDB, which is run by Verizon. It has about 3,000 samples in it. And I also used privacyrights.org, uh, which has a, a breach database of around 9,000 breaches, as you can see. Now, the first step of this, as with any process in statistics, is to gather all the data. And this is always the most annoying part, to get it into the format that you want. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about first adding data that's not available in any of these breach lists. And the majority of that data here that is brand new is the market that it's in, the stock uh, symbol, and whether or not it was uh, publicly traded at the time of. Additionally, we're interested in things like the size of the company. So some of these have the size of the company, some of them don't. Obviously, we need to deduplicate all of these, uh, et cetera. And then we want to deal with what data was breached, which is interestingly not really available in here. Uh, and there's a good reason why it's not available in here. It's kind of, A, hard to determine what that is from news articles. And what is kind of the difference between generic PHI was lost and first name, last name, email, 
Uh, can you really split data based on that? It turns out it's not so simple, but that is something that I enrich the data with. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that all of the uh, amounts of the records breached were listed. Uh, PrivacyRights.org does a good job with that. Varus doesn't necessarily include that information, but that's not necessarily a knock on Varus. And then the breach type. So uh, we did all this, and we came out with about 3,000 total unique companies across around 9,000 breaches, thereabouts. And, uh, and we'll talk about the actual like, breakdown of how many of these were in scope and what our definitions of breach and things like that were in a couple seconds. Before we do that, for some reason, everybody like, is like, oh, all this data is available. I have one question, and the question is always the same. Uh, and it's probably not the question you have, because now that I've said that, you're going to be like, wait, why is that important? But everybody always seems to ask, hey, what day are breaches filed on? Is it really Friday? I don't know why that's the case, but that is definitely the first question that people ask. And you can kind of see that, yes, actually, people do, in fact, file their breach publications on a Friday, which makes sense. Uh, there's other research, not from the statistical point of view, but from, like, sociology point of view, that says that people will like to drown the kind of bad news in the weekend news cycle. It's very interesting. Now, it's not that common here. I don't have a real good hypothesis for why this is the case. Is, in fact, for publicly traded stocks, Friday is still the most common, but the second most common, the penultimate common stock, is... Uh, Monday, and that's not reflective of all the data. As you can see, that's just public traded stocks. If you have any idea why that might be the case, I'd love to hear it. I'm kind of a little bit confused, but that's okay. Uh, it's not that relevant to the actual underlying part of this particular research. So what is a breach? This is the thing that I tried to avoid for a long time and realized I couldn't because these breach lists contain lots of things. And I made some assumptions, I'll be completely honest. Things that probably from a logistics point of view I should have statistically tested. But here's the thing. I think that if someone finds a skimmer at a Bank of America in Tulsa, that's probably not going to affect the underlying stock value of Bank of America. Just a hypothesis, I'm not going to test it, but I'm going to assume it's correct for the purpose of this. There are other things that are just very difficult to correlate and there's not a lot of samples for. So things like defacement and denial of service, I didn't want to include them because I think it skews the data a little bit. And so what I decided was a breach in this case is going to consist of something where there's enough information for me to determine that there were at least 100 records taken. What those records are could be names, could be phone numbers, could be emails, passwords, PHI, banking, whatever. I just care about records. Uh, that means I don't care about, you know, like Timmy who works down at like BNY and has stolen one person's information, I don't necessarily think that's going to matter in this particular case, or at least for this data set. So that's what we called an in-scope breach, and so that allowed us to actually take a look at our bigger correlated data set and kind of prune it. Uh, we had 482 publicly listed companies, about the 3,000 unique companies that were there, and these could be validated. There is uh, information for how to validate it within the GitHub repo that you'll see at the end. And we took these and we said, okay, I need to get historical data. That turns out to be very difficult without paying a lot of money to do for things like OTC markets and the Australian Stock Exchange and like the Finland Stock Exchange. We had things that like I could not find historical data easily for. What I could find was NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. So we isolated it down to those, which took the original 482 and moved it down by 125 uh, breaches. Still not that bad. Still a larger scope, and as you'll see, we'll keep it that way. We then removed uh, in scope, or we removed out of scope breaches, which took down another 205. And for the most part, I feel pretty comfortable with this. A lot of those breaches are skimmers. Uh, and so while those are reported and probably should be rightfully reported by these breach databases, for what we're going to try and do, they are, they're probably not going to have an effect. All right, this left us with 152 in scope breaches which represented about a 550% increase over the previous Comparatech research, which is good because sample size was one of the key problems that I had. Of these, and this is not something that I'm going to talk about, which is completely great, um, 127 companies are represented and there's 152 breaches. Now I think there probably is some research to be done in repeated breaches and the impact on stock market with those. However, there's not so many samples, so it's still really hard to do. But I do find that when I reviewed the data, even I was losing trust in Yahoo after they got breached for like a million records the third time. I was like, ah, I can't use Yahoo anymore. This is crazy. Like, uh, I'll have to switch to something like it's 2009 or whatever. Uh, cool. So we're feeling like, okay, we have a, a breach data set of 152. It has all the information like stock, 
breach type, breach industry, and we'll kind of dissect what that information looks like. The first thing I kind of want to show is in-scope versus out-of-scope breaches and the total size over time. Hopefully this is clear enough. These are years, if you can't see it, they start, they end in 2019. There's really only one thing included there. Uh, and just for posterity's sake, essentially, because we're going to use 2019 and 2020 breaches in order to validate our models later. But the weird thing here, obviously, is that there's a ginormous spike in 2013. Uh, this actually matches the VCDB data. I was really concerned by this at first. And that could be because there was just a lot of reports. It could be because there was more activity. Uh, in any event, though, what's interesting to note is while the jump is still there in the in-scope data, it's not quite as huge, which makes me feel a little bit more comfortable uh, because there is this big gap. We'll uh, kind of delve into that in a little bit more detail as we go further. The other thing to consider here uh, that is of interest is that when we start seeing in like 2009-ish, we start seeing the in-scope breaches representing less than the majority of the total uh, publicly traded company breaches. I'd like to say that's because like the U.S. is getting better at security on average because I only have U.S. stocks for the most part in here. Uh, that's probably not true. That probably just represents a that we have other countries putting in stronger breach protection rules. That's a possible hypothesis. Or that the data is just skewed in that way because there's more reports happening after that time. Something to think about. The next thing people ask me about is, oh, well, what does the industry breakdown look like? Uh, how did you break down which industry these are part of? I actually ended up using the Wikipedia uh, information. And the reason that I did that is that the Wikipedia information had a breakdown that was not as specific as like the VCDB breakdown. Uh, they use some governmental database for what an industry is. And it's very specific, and it can be very useful. But in this case, it's too specific for what I'm trying to do. It's like very difficult to say that. Uh, a com like a travel agent that's governmental is different than a travel agent that's commercial. That, that's too much data for what we need. Uh, so instead we break it down by categories. As you can kind of see, there's like retail, um, healthcare, education. And there's some obvious things here, like education is underrepresented. And that seems confusing because there's things like FERPA. And healthcare seems relatively underrepresented because there's things like HIPAA. The important part to remember is this is just publicly traded stocks. And so education is not usually publicly traded, even if it is for profit, which is still pretty rare. The one sample we have here actually represents a child daycare uh, organization. I didn't know that was so profitable. It's kind of surprising. Uh, in any event, also we see that healthcare, often hospitals are not publicly traded, but there are still a lot of healthcare uh, companies. Surprisingly, still, this is quite a lot of representation for reducing the population set by about half. And so uh, my kind of hypothesis here is that HIPAA does have pretty strict breach re uh, reporting rules, and that's why we're seeing a good amount still reported even IP uh, uh, from IPO'd companies. Now, the 600-pound gorilla in the room is obviously the tech and finance make up the majority of breaches. And there's probably really good reason for this, right? It's because tech and finance have, A, a lot of records. They tend to be early adopters of technology, as the name tech implies. And they often tend to have kind of publicly interacting, publicly facing environments, which makes some sense from what they're doing. So we'll kind of leave it at that and move to the other kind of question that people tend to ask, which is like, what is the makeup of the breach size? And really surprisingly, the most common one is 1 million to 100 million records lost. Uh, that seems like a really large number, and it's like really hard to comprehend what that means until you look at the total number that's represented by this, this data set about 3.5 billion records lost. OK, so how do I put that in context? Well, it's about a record for every other person on the planet. Uh, all right, that's not that important, I guess. But then you look at the total breached companies. So we can do that because even the ones we took out, mostly the foreign companies in this particular case that have breaches, uh, we, can, we have the amount of data records lost. And so that comes to 7.1 billion. OK, so just about one record for every person on the planet. Uh, but then we can look at the privacy data, uh, the privacyrights.org database. And they have breach records for all their reported breaches that are listed. Their total breach report for all of their breaches, all 9,000 that are listed, is 10.5 billion. Now, this is really interesting because it means that 70% of the breaches, roughly, are represented in public organizations. It's a little bit of a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, though, because public organizations tend to have a lot of data. That's not to say that private organizations can't, uh, 
Uh, but in this case, it is a really interesting statistic to kind of look at. All right, we're going to slice the data a little bit more, just one or two more times, and then we're going to actually get to some uh, financial information. So this is uh, the size of the breach over years. And what's interesting is that we actually start to see that it seems like the size of the breach is increasing kind of naively as time goes on. And that speaks like really poorly for where we are right now uh, and security as a whole. So good job, everyone. Uh, but, you know, the other kind of way to look at this is maybe it's just the amount of breaches has increased. So I thought about that and I was like, well, I'm going to need to include a slide that says like overall amount of breaches, breach size. And that's what this is. This is like total amount of records lost over year. And the interesting point to recognize here is 2013, which had the most amount of breaches, actually does not have the most amount of total records lost. In fact, that belongs, that really distinguishing honor belongs to 2018, which is just recently, actually pretty much the last date that this uh, data set collects on. And then that's followed up by 2014 and then 2017. So generally we can see an increasing size of breaches if we kind of discount 2015 and 16, which for some reason uh, don't have that many breaches. That's pretty concerning overall that we're seeing a growth in breaches. Okay, uh, we can kind of deal with that and feel okay going forward. Uh, but it is interesting to know that this is what our data looks like. The last kind of uh, slice that we'll do here is to look at the industry. And so we actually use the privacyrights.org industry breakdown, uh, which is a little bit confusing, so I wanted to go over it here with you. They use the term stat to mean like stationary compromises. There's not many of these because this means someone went in and like physically took a server or like a rack. That would be awesome and like definitely sounds Mission Impossible-esque, but it's definitely not what happens most commonly. As we can see, most commonly is hacks. Uh, after that is card, which is a compromise of like a PCI terminal in some sort of way. Then hacks is this nice general concept, uh, which is a little bit more broad than the VCDB concept, which is, has very specific hacks and kind of makes it somewhat difficult to slice the data and actually sometimes know uh, what's the difference between, you know, malware being installed and like they are, they getting in, they, the attackers getting in via um, maybe like a buffer overflow or a SQL injection. It's really not that important for this research, which is why we went with the privacyrights.org. Uh, information. Uh, then we have the insider. Uh, in one case, there was an unknown. Even though we have all the rest of the information, we just don't know what type of breach it was. So we labeled it as such. Physical attacks, which are things like someone leaving out uh, a filing cabinet or throwing out records and people going dumpster diving. And then port, which is any portable device, typically unencrypted since it'll be reported. So laptops being stolen, USB drives being taken. Uh, this was actually the most surprising to me and one of those things that you can really take home as uh, someone who tries to run a tight security ship is to say, hey, you know, like maybe I can spend my time running that new really sexy breach prevention software or maybe I can just make sure that all of my endpoints are encrypted since 20% of the public breaches in this particular case are uh, portable devices being lost that weren't encrypted. So maybe it's worth your time to encrypt those last four devices rather than going through a breach thing. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the question was, what's the last one on the most uh, right-hand side for you guys? That's unintended disclosure, DISC. It is definitely the most clear one, unclear one. Uh, and what it means is also a little bit unclear. So it means like, oh, I had an issue with my API and I exposed a lot of records unintentionally. Or for in, it even includes things like if you were phished and they asked for like all your W2s and you for some reason, or probably not you, but your HR person sent that to them, that would be within there as well. We have one, one more question. Yeah, that would be unintended disclosure, exactly. Yeah, good, uh, thank you for bringing it up. He brought up that S3 breaches and things like that would also be under unintended disclosure. Absolutely. Cool, so I'm not gonna dwell on this because we get to start going into the actual breach data now and we'll spend the rest of the time there because that's the most fun stuff uh, correlating this. But downloading the data like historically was actually not that simple. Uh, it turned out that it, it really wasn't that easy to get historical time data over a number of different markets. Originally I tried Alpha Vantage. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions, but in this most recent one I used Financial Model Prep. Uh, they actually do a really good job. They have a free API and I don't have to like Selenium anything, which is really nice. Uh, and there's no speed limitations, so I just like smashed through it and it's just like, here's all your data, congratulations. I was like, thanks, 
Um, but in some cases, their data wasn't complete. So there were four cases. They're all online on GitHub if you're interested which ones. Where I actually went to investing.com, which I probably should have started by Seleniuming because uh, they ha you need a username, which is free, and then they'll allow you to download the data. And while it doesn't have all the uh, data points that you might want, you can calculate most of them because, well, that's how data works. Uh, so I'm not going to necessarily talk too much about this. All the data is available online, and uh, you can use it. You don't have to re-download it, uh, which is always fun. All right, so the first thing that anyone would do when we start talking about let's make some money is they'll say the most naive approach is to look at the day before and look at the day after and look at the change. And that is a good approach, except that there's one thing you're not taking into account, and that is the market may go up, and that might alter your change. So we use a pretty common flow that's called the market-adjusted value of the MAV, Essentially, for those of you who don't like math, this is uh, trying to reduce or remove the market's change from the change in the stock price over time. It's not that complicated. Uh, the equation's right there. I'm not expecting you to know what the equation means. If you want to talk about it over a beer, you can. It's a popularly used uh, metric, and you can look it up online as well. So we did this over two markets, and uh, the first one was the NASDAQ. Uh, mostly, we started with the NASDAQ because that's what the Comparatech stuff used. Uh, but there's some interesting initial results, and that is that the average, if we're not even going to look at, uh, at the change, the market adjusted value, is only slightly negative, like 0.013%. Even if that was like a standard deviation of zero, you're probably not gonna be making much money. But if we start looking at the NASDAQ adjusted value, it gets a little bit better, because the NASDAQ is up on average compared to these stocks that are down, so we're looking at an average loss of almost 0.07%, still not really rocking my world. And it becomes completely useless, essentially, when you start looking at the standard deviation. For those of you who remember your basic statistics course, the standard deviation, the first one represents 68% of the data that is within it. And in this particular case, that means that your average is going to be essentially zero, plus or minus 2% on either side, which means there's nothing there. Right, like you might as well just go home and, and play with your ball. Um, so let's look at the New York Stock Exchange composite because maybe that'll be a little bit more helpful for us. It turns out that uh, this doesn't go up as much as the NASDAQ over the time of our breach, so we actually do worse, <laughs> which is fun. And because I wanna bias the data in favor of trying to have good results, I'm gonna use the, Na uh, the, New York, sorry, the NASDAQ for the rest of the time. Don't worry, uh, spoiler, this doesn't actually end up changing the data because uh, there's a lot of standard deviation error here. So, okay, you're saying, well, yes, the news hasn't gotten out yet, so maybe we just need to expand this over a couple more days. And I agree with you, that makes some sense. So let's take a look at what this looks like over one week, uh, over two weeks, over one month, over one year. Okay, so we're actually starting to get numbers at the average level that are not like 0, 0.0. So at one week, we're at 0.7, minus 0.7% on average. But look at that standard deviation go. It's growing like out of control. If numbers are not your thing and you can't kind of visualize what that looks like, don't worry, I've done it for you. It looks like this is completely useless at the beginning and it's super useless like one year at the stand at like uh, time for long-term capital gains. So this approach, obviously, like no one's making any money. Uh, you're like in pure Wall Street bets mode at this point. But maybe, maybe like what's happening is that the data, like some of it is represented in the top and some of it is represented in the bottom and we can find a slice so that we can only access the stuff that's in the bottom percent that's negative, really negative. So what does the data look like? Uh, what I did here is I started charting this and the, the actual time frames, if you can't read it, are five days, 10 days, 30 days, 250-ish days, one year essentially, and then two years. And what I wanted to do, there's various colors, each of those represent one breach. Uh, in the data, you can actually like see what each of those breaches are if you're interested. But I wanted to see if there's kind of like any long tails that are pointing out, if that data has a lot of high and a lot of low. Uh, importantly here that we can see that the uh, y-axis, and I should point this out because some of the y-axis are not identically symmetrical. Uh, so 300% up is at the top of the y-axis and negative 100% is at the bottom, obviously. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, pretty much nothing. We're starting to see that there are definitely some long tails and some long tops, but really at a year and two years out, that's, that's like too far. The stock has readjusted back to its normal effect if it's made it. Uh, so let's take a look at that like little 15, 16 day area, or as it's known in like CSI Cyber, enhance. 
Uh, so this is what we did, and in fact, you're, you're getting some interesting stuff. We're definitely breached up like five days, or consolidated up five days in, uh, but we definitely start to see some tails of point, uh, emerging at the end. Keep in mind that the axis at the negative, the lowest point is negative 50%, and at the highest point is 30% up. So that means that we actually have quite a big tail at the bottom, and maybe it should be possible to dissect by that and just get those. But before I started doing that, I said, hey, you know, maybe like, I just need to know if this is even worth talking about. And so maybe I should just chart versus how the actual NASDAQ performed, who underperformed and who overperformed. And this is probably the most interesting data that you'll see, and it kind of starts to talk about uh, that 14-day period, because that definitely starts to sound right. Uh, we can see that actually the, after one month, 62.5% of the stocks are underperforming the NASDAQ. Now, that's somewhat interesting. Actually, it's very interesting, but that could be like by 0.001%, right? That's not necessarily that helpful. It does mean, though, that you have better than Vegas odds. So, like, don't go to DEF CON and waste your money when you could just maybe just invest in a breach company or short a breach company and see how that goes for you. Um, of course, you may lose a lot of money, as is true by those really long tails that we saw. So, good luck. Um, so let's see if we can maybe like slice this in ways that it's a little bit more useful uh, pretty quickly. So the first one that people always ask about is like, no, it's the size of the breach that matters, dude. Like that's what they'll say. And I'm like, cool, cool, uh, I'll bite. Uh, so the first thing I did was I looked at one million, breaches of one million records or more. And yes, you can see that it's negative, but again, the standard deviations going out to kind of like 5% on either side mean anyone's ball game. I'm not feeling particularly comfortable in investing in that. That represents 42 samples out of the 152. Uh, but what's more interesting is when you start going to 100 million breaches. Now, this is where we start to see this kind of sexy thing where, okay, 68% of the data is negative. I can start feeling comfortable in investing with that. There's one problem, of course. Uh, there's only five samples here. This is not statistically significant. Um, what is kind of nice, though, is that there's an intuitive thought, though, that this makes sense. So even though it's not statistically significant with more data, you would definitely want to keep testing this, uh, and it might be something to test on. We'll see the dangers of relying on statistical significance really soon. Uh, the next thing people go is like, no, man, it's the size of the company. It's not the size of the breach. Uh, I've had these conversations with everybody, and I'm sure we'll have some in a couple minutes as well. Uh, and so kind of the, the next thing I broke down was large company versus small company. Initially, I actually expected this to be that large companies would be infected more, but it turns out to be the opposite. So this is over 100,000 employees. Really, there's negligible difference. We can kind of see out towards the end that the standard deviation is huge, but the average is pretty low. Okay, whatever. Uh, but when you look at less than 100,000 company, uh, 100,000 employee companies, it actually is a little bit more convincing that it's going to be negative. And the hypothesis here is that you know, perhaps people are more worried about these smaller companies because this could have more volatility on their underlying financials. Makes sense, uh, not what I expected. The next thing we'll kind of like people will go into is they'll say, hey, you know, it's actually the news that matters. This was the biggest feedback on the first time I did this. So what I did was like, oh, okay, I can deal with that sort of. Uh, so what I did is I went out and gathered all the kind of information on that stock. So I would search like essentially the company name and breach over the two weeks after the stock on Google Trends. Google Trends is surprisingly like a really useful uh, API to access, and it definitely shows that Google has way too much information. Uh, they should be like doing way better than I am because if this actually mattered, uh, then they would be able to really take advantage of it. So uh, Google essentially returns like a number of pages. There's, there's like a number uh, for the trend amount. So if you said like Aetna breach, it would be like uh, 600, and that represents the number of pages that were kind of trending over that time. Uh, so the first thing is not everybody returned data. In fact, a lot of people didn't return data. There was no like trending for that aspect. And uh, so this is the chart of everybody who returned data. And I was really disappointed. Like initially I was like, this is, this is my ticket in. Like it's gonna be it. So I was like, cool, okay, fine, nothing happened. Maybe I just need like people who returned a lot of data, over 600 pages. Uh, no, actually, in, in fact, this is the inverse of what I want to see. Like, they're doing better. I don't understand the, the bad news. Any news is good news, I guess. It doesn't matter who it, what it is. All right, fine, fine. Uh, that's not the, the glowing smoking gun I thought it would be for correlating this data. So the last thing I did is like, okay, I'll take this industry data and I'll slice it. So what I've shown here is just kind of like 
all the statistically significant ones plus fizz, as we'll see for a while why I did that, uh, the standard deviations of them. So this chart is definitely hard to read, but the important thing to note about this is like, one of these is pretty interesting, and that is fizz. Uh, fizz only has five samples, and this is exactly why it's not good to listen to non-statistically significant data, like what I just told you to do like six slides ago. Uh, because this makes no sense, right? To say like someone broke in and stole 200 records from my organization's like filing cabinet has a drastic impact on the overall stock price is like a uh, illogical jump. I don't believe it. I mean, certainly more data needs to be had, but in this case, it doesn't make much sense. So we run into this nasty problem where we can see here that this looks really good, but I would not start investing based on this. So again, only five samples. Cool, so what do we do when we can't find a slice ourselves? That's exactly right. We start letting automated models deal with it, right? Why, why come up with all the problems while well, other people can solve it or other computers can solve it? So the first approach, and really uh, this was the first like initial approach I thought was linear regression sounds like a good solution. Uh, and honestly, when I started looking at the data to see if it like represented linear data, uh, it, it, it kind of it doesn't. Like, it's not really linear, but when I wrote up this uh, abstract, I said that I did linear regression, and I, I was like, okay, I might as well do linear regression. So, like, hold my beer, let's do the linear regression and see how bad it is. Linear regression also has a really good advantage over things like neural nets and neural net regressors in that you can see with pretty good confidence which features it thinks are most important, and often these are really funny. Um, so, in this particular case, we got an R squared of 25%, which means that it doesn't matter, right? Like, he might as well not even have done this, which is true. Um, <laughs> but we're also using, like, dummy coefficients to represent these, because usually that's how you're going to deal with this. If you don't know that, it just means you essentially break down your stats into, like, columns that represent each of the aspects. So instead of, like, the date, you'll say, like, first of the month, second of the month, third of the month, year 2009, year 2010. These are called dummy coefficients. Uh, so what did it think was most important? And this is really cool. Uh, card style, which is not statistically significant. Stat style, not statistically significant. Unknown, not statistically significant. All of these are less than five samples. Thanks, uh, linear regression. The sixth day of the month. If your breach happens on the sixth day of the month, you better watch out. The fifth day of the month, the 18th of the month, maybe the only one that I might possibly believe is manufacturing breaches, but still not even really. And then the month of November, you really gotta watch out for that. So you would imagine that this uh, looks really bad, and yeah, yeah, it does, right? <laughs> like this is, this is useless. So, okay, cool, our data's bad. Um, and just to be clear, we are comparing the initial uh, linear regressive model that it generated versus the year 2019 and 2020 data. So what do you do when that doesn't work? Well, obviously you say like, maybe it's not linear. Let's go for some neural nets, baby. Uh, our R squared actually does improve here quite a bit. Um, and so I'm feeling okay, but this is not, still not a good model. What it does do really well is it does actually pick the direction of the stock, whether or not it's gonna go up or down. And that's really helpful, actually, uh, in, of, in and of itself. Now, uh, I have uh, Alex back there who will tell me that I've classically overfit my model and like this is a problem, but we did try to kind of separate the data and we're not using the training data that we use for actual calculations. Uh, but yeah, it still probably is a little bit overfit. Like, it, it's a neural net and it's somewhat difficult to judge whether or not that's true in some cases. So what does this look like? How does the neural net perform? Well, it kind of just picks a side and then it increases somewhat linearly, which is an interesting choice for it. Um, okay, cool. Uh, but it does it pretty well. Uh, so you can see, by the way, that the blue is the predicted and the green is the actual. And then these are just four samples I chose. All of them look approximately like this. Cool. Uh, so these are all breaches from 2019. Not bad, right? Like, I'm feeling, okay, like this is as far as I've gotten here, but 62% of the time, every time, right? Uh, we're doing great. So uh, kind of what are the interpreted results? We have to kind of summarize this up real quick. Uh, first is that on average, stocks will underperform the market uh, fo following a breach. Now that might not be like a useful underperformance, but that is statistically significant that they will underperform. Great. Uh, Right now, there isn't a way to slice that underperformance to really maximize for the ones that will underperform. Now, that's not to say that some of these features may not help in the future, things like countries, additional markets and funds. So we don't say like, oh, you know, this is out of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. They, uh, they do really badly after a breach, which would be really interesting. Uh, 
Uh, things like cyclic factors and age. Age is one of those ones that as I was doing this, I was like, I really wish I considered like uh, weighting the older data m less and being like, oh, it's 2018. I mean, the neural net should somewhat try and do that by weighting it by year. Uh, but I definitely think that like 2007 data, 2008 data is not as valuable to us as 2018, 2019 data. And the last part that I didn't try to include because it's really hard to differen dif differentiate what it means is breached aspects. So was it PHI data? Was it usernames and emails and passwords? There should be a classification that you can break this down to. Unfortunately, companies tend to not like to tell you what they lost, uh, which is a little bit annoying. So kind of to summarize before we go into questions is that uh, always remember that there's the ugly and you might strike it rich. Uh, that's a 30% drop like a couple days after the breach. And then there's the guys who are like outperforming the NASDAQ after the breach. Way to go, Starbucks. Uh, so, you know, choose your bets responsibly, <laughs> which is always good. And, uh, and keep in mind that unlike the rest of our industry, you can improve upon this work. All of this work is available in Jupyter Notebooks that generate this and actually way more data that I didn't think was that interesting to include here. So you can download all that and you can launch it really easily. I love that part of data analytics. And you don't need to do this research that we've all probably started to do on our own anyway. You can just make it better. And with that, I may have some time for questions. I don't see the sign guy. Cool, let's, let's do some questions because he's, he's not yelling at me yet. Questions or comments? Questions, comments, concerns, advice. All right, we got one. Uh, that's actually a really good question. So the question was, did you look at what was happening with the stock before? Was it underperforming the market? And then did it continue to underperform or did it overperform? Did it switch course? Did it really underperform? Maybe that's a good feature. I didn't actually look at that. And I think that might be a really cool additional slice. So essentially the name of the game here is to get as many slices as possible and then either try and correlate them yourself or just like pass it off to a statistical model. Uh, something to definitely do. So th thank you for that. In, in the back, in the brown shirt. Did you uh, consider the impact of um, research cases versus closed cases? Like, further away from That's a really cool question. So the question was, would you consider looking at the, uh, the effects of when the breach was disclosed versus when the earnings report was? I definitely didn't consider that. I did have some data about like uh, whether or not dividends was up or down and things like that. Uh, but not when the actual earnings report was. And what's interesting is some of these are like sent out years after the actual breach occurred, which is like super sloppy. Uh, but that is maybe a cool, interesting thing to consider. And I would assume that maybe there's like a correlation, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with the stock price in the end, right? It's just them trying to bury it so that their quarterly earnings sound better. And the analysts are like, yeah, bye, bye, bye. All right, uh, let's do one all the way in the back. So, so that's definitely the age. So the question is like, have you done any analysis to see that like people are just like, another breach of 500 million records, like there we go, there goes my passport. Like OPM already lost all of this stuff, don't care, right? That's essentially the question. Uh, that's a really good question and that's, that's why I said that I think like age, uh, really would be an interesting, okay, that's a cool thing to put up. Thanks, PowerPoint. Um, age would be a really interesting thing to consider in this equation. Um, I, I think that people are somewhat jaded, but as you see, the overall size is also increasing. So that's uh, kind of a way to unjade us, maybe. I think we all just gave up at this time point. Yeah, certainly if they're doing business in the EU, it does apply. And then there's CCPA uh, if you're feeling pretty good. What, oh, the question, thank you. He also said the comment was uh, keeping in mind that there should be more breaches essentially because of GDPR and now people are more aware of the fact. The fines are much greater. Oh, yes. And the fines are, are much greater. Uh, this is an interesting point that people keep bringing up with GDPR just from like a 
technical point of view. Well, the fines maximum is much greater. Uh, we still haven't seen anybody lose like 4% of their total like take home. That would be cool though. I'm really excited for that. Uh, I think we have maybe like one or two more questions. So let's go to the one in the back. If there's no market punishment for security failures, should we all just give up? I'm, I'm just not even going to say the last part. Um, yes. <laughs> no, no. So, so as I kind of said in the beginning, um, there are market punishments for security failures. They're just not at the like stock level. So you are almost for sure going to be sued. That is going to cost you some money. Now, whether or not that's worth all of our salaries combined is certainly it's probably not. Um, but. The, the game you gotta have to play is you need what are essentially standard security controls and by, by all accounts you should talk to a lawyer and not me, obviously, but if you have like standard security controls for your market when you got breached, you have a little bit more protection against uh, people who are going to sue you. So that's why we all pretty much have jobs, which really jades my life because it means that I don't really need to be putting that sweet new SIM in place or whatever it is, the threat intel platform. I just need to be like doing what you know, the median company is doing, the average company is doing, and that's going to give me the best return for my buck. Uh, so I feel really good about, like, the work that I actually do, but maybe it's not actually that helpful, which is kind of that, uh, that weird thing to consider. So yeah, yeah, just quit, man. Like, whatever. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, that's probably all my time. I'll be here, so if you have, you have one more question, but I'll just be up front, you can come and ask it. And of course, you can keep updating the data. Like, the whole reason is stop reinventing the wheel. We always do it as InfoSec, but like, you can just keep inventing this, this data. It already exists, and you can enrich it. Uh, so thank you, and uh, thanks, Smucon. Thanks, Heidi and Bruce and all of them.